Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Michael, for the opportunity to come and present not only Anson's perspective, but an industry perspective. And following the amazing presentations from today, it's not at all daunting to be the last speaker as well and be the only thing standing between you and a cold beer on a Friday evening, so I will be brief. Okay. So just to, by way of introduction, I just wanted to share a little bit of background around Janssen's strategy and haematology, where we are today, where we intend to go in the future. And I think then you'll see why we believe that the, the fit with BCNI and the, the benefits of partnership are, are evident. So certainly myeloma and AML are two disease areas we've focused on to date, but that we will continue to focus <coughs> on even more in the future. So starting off in 2004 with the approval of Velcade, I think this was the first opportunity to give Irish patients on a broad scale access to a, a treatment that really started to make a difference for these patients. We hope to, to move on and give even more patients act, access to daratumumab in the future. And I think you know, a lot of the themes today are around access for patients. And I'm proud to say that we've been able to give access to 15 patients in Ireland so far. It's not a huge amount, but I think it's, it's an important start. On the AML side, we're probably not so well known, but we do have uh, decitabine or, or dacogen, the, the other hypermethylating agent that's used for patients who are ineligible for the intensive approach to therapy. And I think we all recognize that the treatment options for these patients are, are very limited. These hypomethylating agents will only give a, a complete response rate in about 20% of patients. But for that reason, and while we continue to develop on immunotherapy and other agents in the future, we'll still commit to developing decitabine. We'll do it in different dosing schedules, more intensive 10-day regimens, and in combinations that are already starting to show much higher benefits than that we've seen with single agent treatment. So in the future, uh, thankfully we seem to be on the right path following Alan's presentation this morning. We are looking at immunotherapy. Um, so th this agent here, CSL 362, or now called this long J and J name, 473, a monoclonal antibody targeted against CD123. And what we're starting to see at this early stage is, is that uh, decitabine can actually upregulate the CD123 on the surface of the AML cell. Azacitidine can also do this. So it's a promising combination that we're looking at for patients with AML, and we currently have a phase two study open. And the other agent is imatelstat, a telomerase inhibitor. So again, a very novel target. We're, we're starting to evaluate that more in myelofibrosis and MDS to start, but we have AML on the future horizon. So moving a little bit away from the drugs, disease interception is really an important area of focus for us. I think we've all seen the dismal outcomes of patients with AML and with myeloma. So if we can start to understand where we can intercept these diseases before they evolve to this fully fledged AML and myeloma, I think we'll be making some good progress. And I think this is a, a critical partnership that we need to build with the biobank so that we can follow the evolution of the disease over time and really, really learn where we need to intercept and how we need to intercept at different stages. And then finally, we have a, a very keen interest in investing in novel science innovation. We want to look at new targets, what's really going to move the needle for these patients. And in the endpoints, and, and picking up on some of the earlier points today, minimal residual disease is a key area of focus for us. Michael already alluded to the, the um, progress that's been made in myeloma, but on the AML side, we've also engaged with the FDA earlier this year on how we can start to build MRD into clinical trials so it can be evaluated in a consistent way. So we have uh, lots of ambitions, but I think we're, we're headed in the right direction, and I think through partnership, hopefully we'll be able to bring more of these treatments to patients quicker. So Janssen is actually part of, of Johnson & Johnson, if you didn't know already. Um, we're over 120,000 employees and 250 companies. And while that might sound like a great resource, it, it means sometimes we can take a while to, to make a decision. So we do recognize, despite the size of the company, that it's essential that we partner to bring um, innovative treatments to patients quicker. I think we've had some nice partnerships with Pharmacyclics to bring ibrutinib to the market, with Genmab obviously to bring daratumumab to the market, but coupled with that we need to invest in novel combinations, so we need to work with our partners to, to really look at which combinations 
can be used to, to deliver the best benefits. But aside from the industry partners, I think the partners with academia are absolutely critical. This is where we need to invest in cutting edge research, identify partners who are really moving the needle in terms of preclinical work and make sure that we partner with them to effectively develop our drugs. We really need to take on the advice and guidance of, of experts to make sure that we can fast track the, the treatments, but in the right way and by asking the right questions. So one thing we've done is we've established five innovation centres across the world, uh, the nearest one being in London, but the one in Boston actually having a, a, a translational oncology programme with uh, MD Anderson. Um, so this is, a, this is a facility whereby young investigators can go into the labs, essentially with no money, but just some great ideas, and we will fund their early research until they get to a stage where they, can, they have found something viable that they, continue, they can continue with. So that's an important area for us to invest in, in very early science. I think looking at partnerships with key scientific groups, we have some very nice collaborations with EORTC, uh, again with Decida being in the 10-day regimen for fit patients, so to try and get this agent used in a curative uh, setting, and also with the Hovon group in a, in a pick a winner type style, um, again in AML. I'll talk to the collaborations with the Blood Cancer Network in a, in a moment. I think they're absolutely critical, and I think Michael has alluded to them uh, already today. So looking at the collaborations with BCNI, first of all in myeloma, you see the, the Cyborg D DARA trial, and, and Michael's already spoken to that. But I think one of the reasons that Janssen really invested in this type of design is the robust translational and correlative work. So really looking at the how cyclophosphamide can enhance the daratumumab uh, cell killing in myeloma. We really want to not just fund trials, but to invest in trials that can lead, lead somewhere, that can really enhance our understanding of how the drugs are working. And with this one, obviously with, with positive results, will be the basis of a large phase three trial for the European myeloma network. And I think that's where there's a real differentiator in terms of IISs of this, this quality. Uh, on the AML side, as I said earlier, we're a little bit earlier on in development, but we have some very nice collaborations ongoing with AVA, looking at our monoclonal antibody, our CD123 antibody, where AVA is looking at um, the best combinations to take to the clinic, because again, these patients don't have much at the moment, they don't have time, and we need to really invest in the most promising preclinical uh, combinations that we're seeing. Last but not least, uh, the Biobank and the Registry, actually. I mean, both of them are coupled. They're in the very early stages. They will be a really important resource when it comes to reimbursement discussions. Payers want to see data from patients in this country. And I think it's important that we invest on a continuous basis. I think investing year by year is not enough. I think we need to make long-term commitments to these projects. <laughs> So again, why, why the fit? Why do we think this is a good partnership? Well, to start with, I think we have common goals. We want to provide access to patients, and certainly through the trials that will provide early access to, to patients in Ireland. From a company perspective, we want that access to be even more sustainable. So when the trial is finished, what happens then? We have to look at early access programs. When that's finished then, if we haven't successfully nego negotiated a price, we have another issue with access. So certainly access is something we want to view as a continuum. And certainly both the BCNI and Janssen are committed to novel and innovative science, uh, different and exciting modes of action that will really transform these diseases. So I think we certainly have common goals and we also have common focus. So while we are all interested in, in hematological malignancies, again, we've, we've selected the two and the two AML and myeloma here are in the top three of small numbers of clinical trials and approvals. If you look at AML, since 1995, actually 2015 is not included, so we have azacytidine here too, but with gemtuzumab um, taken off the market, there's, as I said, only the two hypermethylating agents, and this is just clearly not good enough. It's so much so the, the EMA has actually approached both Janssen and Celgene to remove the age restriction from the label from both drugs. 
because there's nothing else for younger patients who can't tolerate the intensive approach to therapy. And this is an area where it would have been very useful for us to have really good registry data because we didn't include those patients in our trials. The trials were for older patients, so we had to scramble through different trials to try and pull together as much data as we could in younger patients, but still the EMA recognised the unmet need. And I think speaking to the data at ASH as well this year, we can see that lots of trials are ongoing in combination with hypomethylating agents. Uh, the one that Michael spoke to, uh, either, either azacitidine or decitabine in combination with venetoclax, showing very good responses. There's the Seattle Genetics SGN CD33A compound. So I think while we're waiting on the immunotherapies to evolve, we have to continue to work and, and continue to develop the hypomethylating agents. I think myeloma is doing a little bit better than, than AML, particularly with uh, daratumumab and elatuzumab and exazomib in the last year. That's, that's certainly a big advance. So as well as the common goals and the common focus, I think we all also have common challenges. We have increased demand for early access from patients, and, and rightly so. We have a challenge when it comes to regulatory approval times. We look to what's happening in the US and we say, what's happening here? Why can't we be so quick? And then time to market access. So even when we get the drug over the line, we are all excited to see daratumumab approved, but it's not reimbursed. And we can only provide access today to 15 patients. We really want to do better than that. So this is an interesting case I wanted to share with you, and it relates to early access where you don't have a lot of data. So this uh, boy, Josh Hardy, he had a series of hematological malignancies from the age of two. Uh, he contracted an adenovirus and was treated with an FDA-approved antiviral agent. It didn't work, and then they, his family applied for access to a non-approved antiviral agent. So there was no data in this, in this uh, indication. The drug was being developed for other purposes. Uh, but the, under the Right to Try campaign and with intense social media pressure in the US, there was actually a situation where the CEO of the company had received death threats and ultimately had to resign from the job. And I think the message I'm trying to send here is, and to, to Jim's point earlier, we've got to bring patients on the journey with us. We've got to communicate with patient advocacy. We have to have an aligned message. We need to make it very clear that we have to act in an ethical way when it comes to access, and we can't give treatments where we don't really understand how safe they are. So I think we do need to provide access, but we need to provide it in an aligned way and in a controlled way based on the data that we have. So what we've done at Janssen is we have collaborated with New York University um, to have an external opinion on who should actually access our treatments through early access programs. So this panel consists of external physicians, ethicists and patient advocates. And we put daratumumab through this pilot. And I think in every case, maybe a bar one, there was agreement with the external committee and Janssen in terms of who actually received the treatment. And again, we had an added challenge here of, of drug supply. But we do think that by engaging the patients, engaging physicians, and bringing you along with our treatment decisions, it helps us work better uh, as partners. So this is something we look to, to develop more and hopefully use with, with further early access programs. So another challenge then is, is the review and regulatory approval. So I'm picking out ibrutinib uh, because we, we spoke about it yesterday at the advisory board as well. It took a year extra to get the drug approved in Europe and even then the drug is not reimbursed today in Ireland. This has taken way longer than it, than it should have. Um, I think when you look to the mechanisms, the fast track mechanisms in the US between priority review, accelerated assessment, uh, breakthrough designation, um, and, and we didn't have any of that in Europe at the time. So it went through the standard process despite showing transformational results. So that's a real challenge for us. And I think what we, we need to do is, what we're seeing in the US is more and more approvals on the basis of phase one and phase two data. 
in Europe that data is just not holding up. So I think with the phase one, two clinical trials unit here, we can work together to develop really, really robust phase one, two trials mm -hmm. and hopefully fill some of those gaps. Thankfully, the, the European uh, Medicines Agency have now launched a, a new priority review system for medicines that allows us to engage with them at an earlier stage under this prime initiative. It allows uh, promising medications have access to a, an expert panel. They give us advice on how to develop our drugs, how to adapt our clinical development programs, and the result is to result in earlier marketing authorization approval of the drugs. And again, I think this is something that we need to partner with academia on in developing and, and changing our plans, our development plans, as they progress. I think the challenge is we don't have a prime initiative when it comes to market access. So while we have one part of the process accelerating to get drugs approved quicker, we still have a big challenge when it comes to reimbursement. And we can have the best drugs in the world, but if patients can't access them, that, that's a big problem. I think here looking at a lot of the major European countries, Ireland is actually at quite a disadvantage when it comes to market access because we do have to wait a long time. The review process should typically be it's on the next one, about 180 days, but you can see it's taking much, much longer than that. And we have successfully put, for example, ibrutinib through the HTA review process. It was approved in December and it still hasn't, the, the, the stamp still hasn't been given to, to have it paid for. That should have happened around January of this year. So we've done what we can, but we, need, we still need to do more and keep advocating for access to, to treatments. With the other large, uh, the G5 countries, very often you have reimbursement at point of approval, and then you've got to prove your worth a year later. You've got to, to supplement your data package. In Italy, you have this special law that will allow you to use medicines prior to reimbursement on the basis of showing um, very positive results. But this is a, a really big challenge. And I think the, a really sobering fact, and you know, the presentations today have been so great, they've been so encouraging, fantastic data, but the front page of the Irish Times today doesn't give us a good message. It's, it's not acceptable. Um, this particular article is about nivolumab and pembrolizumab, early access programs coming to an end, and doctors don't know what to do. There was advocacy on the radio this morning for these two agents, and this is what we're going to need to continue to do for, for drugs and haematological diseases as well. So moving on a little bit, and what else can Ireland get involved with um, in terms of data generation and, and contribution to research? And I think this IMI2 Harmony initiative, it's uh, the largest uh, public-private partnership um, 50% funded by the EU Commission, 50% by FPA, the Pharmaceutical Regulation, uh, the Pharmaceutical Representative Society. And I think this is focused on, on big data. It's focused on collaboration. It has 44 partners, 10 European countries, and the option for other affiliate countries to join. So what it's going to do is going to look at diseases, how they're treated today, what the, the major unmet medical needs are, and how we need to, to redefine the priorities and outcomes that we need to be, to be looking at. It's also going to look at new compounds, it's going to look at the current treatment strategies, and what we, how we need to develop algorithms um, to inform clinical practice. So this is very much at, the, at its infancy. We have just had a, a couple of meetings uh, so far. There's seven pharmaceutical partners um, with academic experts, and we're each starting to look at the diseases in detail and really evaluate what the top priority needs are and then move from there. But because there's only 10 European countries involved as, as core members, there, as I said, there is an opportunity for additional countries to join and access some of the funding that's available here. So I think that's something we can do as a, as a country to try and get involved here. It, it, the, the, the cost of entry will be data, so we certainly have an opportunity to, to share the data that we'll be generating locally into this project. Another initiative we looked at in Janssen was following an advisory board. 
where AML clinicians said to us they had nowhere to come and to, to talk to their peers about clinical trial design in AML. So Professor Charles Craddock from the UK uh, Arena and Transplanter really highlighted all of the issues that were discussed earlier today around the issues of designing clinical trials and the problems. Too few patients, partly addressed with the, the pick a winner style trials, and the unacceptably long time for approval and uh, market access. So the proposal was that we, we set up a, a group um, of international uh, and European experts who are interested in clinical trial design in AML. I think this is a real opportunity for the BCNI to come in, um, have a seat at the table and really work to develop, um, I won't say standardized IISs, but have an aligned approach to how IISs in, in AML can be conducted in the future, what makes sense, um, and, and have a forum where these discussions can take place, because we've been, we've been made aware that this currently isn't available. So just to, to finish up, I, I don't want to have too bad, too sour a note after all of the, the, the great excitement around the data. I mean, certainly as, as an industry, collaboration is key. Uh, there's quotes here from three of the three of our leaders, basically in the company, our company group chair Jane Griffiths, advocating that partnership is 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 uh, absolutely critical to the success of of getting patients access to treatments quicker. Uh, my boss Thomas Stark, the vice president of medical affairs, ensures everything we do is patient centric. He challenges us that every dollar, every euro that we spend. What's it doing for patients? And that's something we have to keep in mind every day. And then Craig Tendler ensures, our Vice President for, for Global Medical Affairs, ensures we go to the end of the earth every day. And sometimes it really does feel like that. But I think, I think that's worth it. So I want to wrap up with a, a short video, if it works, to hopefully let everybody go home on a, an inspiring note about what we can achieve together.
So I hope that leaves you with a note of what we can achieve when we, when we actually do pull together. And then to end with the, the words of our inspiring founder, I think we absolutely have to collaborate and we have to advocate uh, for the patients who are waiting, like Jim and many more. Thanks very much.